Thank you for joining with me, and thank you for taking time to be a part of this online worship gathering. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. I encourage you as we pray and invite God's presence into this online service this morning, take your burdens and your cares and your needs to the Lord, and we'll agree together as touching the needs that you have, and let's believe God that he'll not only bring healing and deliverance and blessing, but also his anointing will rest upon the service this morning. So join with me as we pray, and you take your prayer requests to the Lord as well. God bless you as you seek the Lord in prayer. Join with me now as we open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the opportunity to come together to worship um, this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning that you've given us. We pray that you'll bless the preaching and ministry of the Word of God. Let this message have free course in our hearts and our lives this morning. Father, we pray for all the needs that we have in our own individual lives and families today. We pray for those that are sick and afflicted, those that are in the hospital, those that are in need of healing. We pray that you'll touch them and bless them by the healing power of the Holy Spirit. For with your stripes, Lord Jesus, we are healed. We pray that you'll meet the material needs and the financial needs that we have. Bless those that are in need today. We pray for those that are seeking for spiritual revival and renewal. We pray that you'll bless them as well, Lord, and let your Holy Spirit anoint and quicken us today. I give your word free course, anoint everything that is said and done, and we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. We are continuing a current lesson series message series, excuse me, that I've titled uh, Words of My Father. And these, of course, are selected messages from the pulpit of my father, Pastor Terry Skiles. And uh, he has preached these messages over the course of 37 years of pastoral ministry. And the next several weeks, I'm going to be taking uh, messages that he preached from his own pulpit as a pastor and share them with you. Uh, my father is now retired and so he's no longer preaching or active in ministry, but he has given me a wealth of information and a wealth of uh, biblical knowledge and understanding as well as a lot of sermon material as well. And so the message that we shared last week was on the man in the middle. And this morning, we're going to look at our second message in this series, and that is a message that is titled, Watch Out for Shishak. Watch Out for Shishak. So let's go ahead and read. 2 Chronicles 12, we'll read verses 1 through 11, and, um, and we'll unpack this very, very important message this morning. It reads, And it came to pass, when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, because they had transgressed against the Lord. With 1,200 chariots and three score thousand horsemen, that's 60,000. And the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt, the Lubians, the Sukiums, and the Ethiopians. And he took the fifth cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Then came Shemaiah, the prophet to Rehoboam, and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak. And said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they had humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made, and instead of which... King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them again into the guard chamber. And again, the message title uh, this 
this morning is watch out for Shishak. Now, this is an interesting message because Shishak was the king of Egypt or the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the enemy uh, of the Jews, the enemy of the Israelites. Now, many of us know that God delivered the Israelites and the Hebrews out of the hand of Pharaoh and the Egyptians and delivered them from the bondage of Egypt in the book of Exodus. And when the children of Israel departed after the plagues had fallen upon Egypt and Pharaoh finally said after the Passover that Moses and the Hebrews could leave and sent them away, the Bible says that they spoiled the Egyptians, which means that they took, uh, they took treasures and they took possessions uh, that the Egyptians gave them that they took with them. And uh, Egypt had always been the enemy of Israel. And now we see here, many, many years later, uh, where King Shishak rose up against the people of Israel. Now, we must realize that Israel was not in the place they needed to be and was not doing what God had commanded him to do. By this point, the kingdom was divided because of disobedience and because of sin. And now Rehoboam had tried to make an allegiance with the enemy. In fact, some scholars say that he was related to Shishak by marriage. And we now read where Shishak, of course, sat Jerusalem in 926 BC. And his story is found not only here in 2 Chronicles 12, 1 through 11, but it's also in 1 Kings 14 and verse 25. And what this story, this, what this story illustrates to us and what this story and this message should convey to us as Christian believers is that everything that we see happening here with Rehoboam, with the children of Israel, and allowing themselves to be weakened to the point where the enemy could come in and overtake them is a very clear clarion call to the church of today. The Bible says in Romans 15 and verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. This story here of the, uh, of the sacking of Jerusalem by Shishak reminds us that we need to be very, very careful and be very, very mindful of how we're living in this day and age. Israel, in their entire story from their covenant beginning with Abraham through Isaac and Jacob and then later on to their establishment as a nation under the Lord God Jehovah, is full of illustrations where they were disobedient, where they rebelled, where they did wrong and, and did not do what was right in the sight of God. And God would always bring them into judgment by allowing them to fall back into the hands of their enemies. And here we see where Shishak is the enemy that overtook them. So as Christians, we need to be careful and be mindful of our enemy, Satan. But much like in the Old Testament, the children of Israel did not watch out for Shishak. They did not understand how important it was to follow God. And so this message this morning is going to convey to us some points to help us be careful as to how we live in this current day and age. The Bible tells us in the word of God, to him that think he standeth, take heed lest he fall. We have to be careful and we have to be mindful. So as we look at this story here of Shishak and his, and his defeat of Jerusalem and how God used this to turn his people back to him, we see the first point we want to convey this morning is we want to look at the danger of disobedience and rebellion towards God. Because the Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles 12 and verse 1, And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom, and he strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. So you see here where it just wasn't the king, but it was all of the people of God that had forsook the law of the Lord. And God made it very clear that his people were not to be disobedient. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 26 through 28, God said to his people, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I commanded you this day. 
to go after other gods which ye have not known. We see here where Rehoboam and all of Israel with him in 2 Chronicles 12 and 1 acted in complete disobedience and forsook the law of God. And it's important to understand rebellion is not tolerated by a holy God. In, in 1 Samuel 15 and verse number 23, we read here in the scriptures where Samuel said to Saul, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul's disobedience cost him his kingdom. Rehoboam's disobedience and forsaking of the law of God allowed him to not only be susceptible to his enemy, but God brought judgment in the form of King Shishak. Shishak, much like the enemy of our soul, is just waiting for a moment of weakness, just waiting for an opportunity to pounce. That's why we have to always understand that disobedience and rebellion will lead to God's judgment and correction. That's why the Bible tells us that whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. God doesn't want to have to punish us, but when we're disobedient and when we are no longer, uh, no longer obedient and, 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 and following in what his word says, and we begin to rebel just like the children of Israel, we are going to fall into the hands of a very angry God. God dealt with Israel because of their disobedience and because of their rebellion. The second point of this message we want to unpack is we want to realize that Israel's disobedience brought judgment. Israel's disobedience brought judgment. They disobeyed the word of the Lord and they transgressed against the Lord their God. And the disobedience brought God's judgment in the person of Shishak, the king of Egypt. He came up and he not only sacked Jerusalem, but he came against Israel. The Bible tells us there in 2 Chronicles 12, 2 through 5, and it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. There's the reason why this all happened. They transgressed against the Lord. Verse 3 says, With 1,200 chariots, threescore thousand horsemen, and the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt, the Lubiums, the Sukiums, and the Ethiopians. And he took the fifth cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of of Shishak. So their disobedience brought the judgment of God, and the prophet of God called them out for their disobedience, and God allowed them to fall into the hand of Shishak as a form of judgment. God could have let them be utterly destroyed, could have let them continue to walk in sin, but God sent judgment to turn them back to him. God will always judge disobedience, but it is not meant it is not meant for our evil, but for our good. When Joseph was sold into slavery and then later imprisoned after he was wrongly accused by Pharaoh or by Potiphar's wife, it's many, many years later before he stands before Pharaoh and interprets the dreams that ultimately takes him from the prison cell to riding second chariot with Pharaoh. But all of that was for a purpose. Many people would think that God was judging Joseph. God was using those, those unfortunate incidents, as Joseph said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God's judgment, while it is harsh and while it is not something we want to experience and while we don't like to be corrected, while we don't like to be dealt with, God will bring a shy shack into our life to help us understand we need to no longer walk in disobedience. That's why it's very clear that we understand that disobedience is what brought judgment. And Israel saw that time and time and time again. And because Judah disobeyed the word of the Lord and did not follow what the word of the Lord said, that's why they fell in to this judgment. Because many, many years earlier, 
whenever King Saul was anointed to be the king of Israel. He was the first king that was granted to the people of Israel, even though, even though they cried out for a king and God was their king. They wanted a physical king, and Samuel anointed Saul to be their king. And he warned and, and told them how important it was that they obey the word of the Lord. So when he presented Saul to them in 1 Samuel 12, 13 through 15, after he's anointed him to be the king, after he has placed him in that, that seat of authority, the man of God, Samuel, says in 1 Samuel 12, verses 13 to 15, Now therefore behold the king whom ye have chosen, and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both he and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandments of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. So the warning was right there. The warning was right there. And yet, <laughs> they were still disobedient. Not just with King Saul, but there were king after king after king that followed Saul and David and later on generations to follow these kings, you read about it in the Chronicles and in the book of First and Second Kings, where these, these kings did not do right in the sight of God. They did evil in the sight of God, and they were judged for it. God will not wink at sin, and God will not wink at disobedience. What we need to learn from, from this point here is that just like when Israel disobeyed God, he brought correction and judgment, we have to understand that God will not tolerate disobedience in our life. That's why it's so important that we confess our sins, we repent of our sin, and we walk close to the Lord. Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And our third point we want to unpack here is this. Judah did repent, but God still judged their obedience. In other words, they still had to face the consequences for their actions. And in 2 Chronicles 12, verses 6 through 11, it tells us that the royal princes and the kings and the chamberlains of, of, the, of the king's house and many there that were in the kingdom and were followers of the king, they were they were shut up in the king's house. They were hiding for fear of Shishak. And it was there that they humbled themselves. They knew what had befallen them. And they offered repentance. And God allowed them to be forgiven. However, they still had to face correction and judgment because of their disobedience. Go back and look at, at 2 Chronicles chapter 12. And you look at verse 6 through 11. It says, whereupon... The princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. So he didn't utterly destroy them, and he didn't utterly wipe them out, he granted them some deliverance, which meant the punishment was not that harsh, but it was still a punishment just the same. And of course, what happened here? The Bible says in the scriptures, in verse 8, Nevertheless, they shall be his servant, servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the country. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried away all this, also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And instead of which God or which King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them again into the guard chamber. Shishak sacked the city of Jerusalem. He took all the gold and treasures of the temple and of the house of God and took them out. 
And so to say that he sat Jerusalem is very clear. He took a lot. He, he came in and plundered and sat this holy city of Jerusalem. And he robbed Israel of many of the blessings of God. I say that to say this. We can repent and we can call upon God when we sin and we disobey God. But there is still a price for sin that we pay. You know, the Bible says in Galatians 6, verse 7 and 8, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You see, sin has a price. We reap what we sow. And what is so tragic here is that while Israel did repent and God spared them from total judgment and destruction, they still had to feel the sting of their rebellion. You know, it's amazing how people do not understand that our actions have consequences. Shishak was a, was a byproduct and a result of what happens when we sin. And it's important we understand that sin has a price. Disobedience has a price. We have to be very, very careful because what happens is ultimately that judgment comes. And it's so imperative that we do understand that. Because many times, many times we think about what has happened to us or, or what has transpired in our life. And we can't blame anybody but ourselves. Because we have been uh, the ones that have given in. Now, Rehoboam was the king, and he was tempted and forsook the word of the Lord. He went in, he, he formed a, a, a coalition, or he formed an allegiance with his enemy, Rehoboam. No wonder the Bible says, neither give place to the devil. In fact, the Bible says in James chapter 1, uh, in the scriptures, in verse number uh, 13, 14, and 15, it says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So it wasn't God that caused Rehoboam to go into that place where he rebelled against God. No, verse 14 of James 1 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15 of James 1 then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And verse 16 says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. James warns us about the dangers of being disobedient. That takes us to our fourth and final point. Israel, because of their disobedience, gave place to their enemy. Now, I want you to think about this as I bring this final point home. Shishak was the king of Egypt. And as we read in 2 Chronicles 12, 6 through 11, God heard the cry of repentance by the king and the princes of the king's house and of the kingdom. And God did not destroy them. God had compassion and mercy on them, but he still allowed them to feel the corrective punishment of his judgment. And so what happens is not only does he allow Jerusalem to be overtaken, not only does he allow Shishak, the king of Egypt, to come and do that, but it all comes full circle. The same, the same Pharaoh, the same family, the same house that ruled in Egypt when Moses said, let my people go and brought the Israelites out of Egypt and spoiled the Egyptians on their way out going into the land of Canaan. Now, hundreds of years later, that same house and kingdom, the Pharaohs, Shishak, the Pharaoh or the king of Egypt, came back and spoiled the Israelites and took all the gold and took all of the precious things of the house of God and sacked Jerusalem. To the point where Rehoboam had shields of brass made instead of gold. Which means that Israel was not the same as it was before it had rebelled against God. There is a price for sin. And when you allow that to happen, the enemy can and will overtake you. How do I know that? All you have to do is look in the word of God 
at how many how many times in the word of God where people have given place to the enemy and have faltered and have failed. Uh, you look at where Satan entered into the heart of Judas and he betrayed Jesus. Uh, you can see where uh, the Apostle Paul speaks of a, of a fellow servant named Demas, and he said in one of his letters, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world more than the things of God. You see, the enemy can come, and he can steal, kill, and destroy. And just like Shishak came and stole the things of God from Israel, and he took away those precious things, Israel was a shell of its former self. We can become a shell of our former selves spiritually. The enemy can rob us of that. Shishak can come in and can do severe damage if we don't watch out for him. So in closing, I want to encourage you to take this message to heart this morning and let this message sink into your spirit. If you're not living in obedience to the Lord, and if you're not walking in obedience to his word, repent of that sin. Repent of your disobedience. And turn your heart back to God. James 4 verse 7 and 8 says, Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's what we should do. Because if we don't watch out for Shishak like the, like the people of Israel did, we will be overtaken by the enemy. So let's not give place to the enemy. Let's not give place to Satan. Let's not allow our sin and disobedience to come up and be a part of us. Let's repent. Let's make confession of that sin. And let's walk holy before God. So join with me as we pray this morning. And ask God to bless us as we dismiss. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the opportunity that we've had. To share this message today. Lord, there's a powerful theme and message and illustration. In the life of Shishak, the king and Pharaoh of Egypt. Lord, don't let us give place to the devil. Don't let us be deceived or mocked or led astray. Help us to always be obedient to you. And Lord, if we've been disobedient, if we've been unfaithful to your word, if we've been disobedient to your commands, if we fail to follow after you, Father, forgive us as we humbly ask for your forgiveness. Father, we ask that you'll bless us today as we go through this uh, beautiful day of the Lord that we have and as we move into this next week of our lives. Help us to be humble and obedient and to follow you. And Lord, help us to resist the devil, to stand firm in faith, and to walk by faith and not by sight. Now, Father, we pray you'll be with us as we dismiss in this place, but not your presence. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you and thank you for joining with me this morning. And I hope that the message was a blessing to you. Just a reminder to join us on Wednesday for Wednesday in the Word as we continue our study of the book of Romans. And join us next week as we continue with our series, Words of My Father, with message number three. So you have a wonderful week. I pray that God will bless you this week and prosper you and keep you in health. And God be with you, and we'll see you all next time.